Hello Church, it is good to get to be with you on this wonderful Sunday. Uh, I don't know about you, but here in Oregon, it really feels like fall time. There's lots of rain, it's been windy, and I think it's been wonderful. I've been getting all my flannels out, I've been enjoying my beanies. I love this time of year. And I pray that as we get into this time of year, that um, it would be full of blessing for you. You know, honestly, the November, December can be kind of a mixed bag. Sometimes it's filled with joy and expectation, and sometimes it's kind of full of stress and remembering what we used to have, but we don't anymore. But the beautiful thing is, is that I truly believe that during this season, that whether it's a season of extreme joy, maybe a season of extreme pain, that Jesus wants to be a part of your story either way. That whatever you're going through right now, that Jesus wants to be a part of your story and wants to see how he could impact your story for the better once you get to be a part of his story. And we invite you to uh, just join us in finding out what that is and growing closer to him because that's what we do here on Sundays when we get together. We spend time focusing in on who Jesus is, growing closer to him, falling in love with him, and seeing what he invites us into. So here's what we're going to do as we kind of um, explore some of those ideas today. I'm going to start by just giving you a few ideas of what we got going on in the life of the church. Then I'm going to uh, share a little, uh, then we're going to have a little bit of music that we're going to share, a time for us to open our hearts and our minds to what Jesus is doing in our lives. And then we're going to have a time where we uh, read from the Bible together to find out what Jesus invites us into today. Uh, so as we kind of... Um, get started. I just want to invite you to get connected up with the church. Lots of ways you could do that. A great way to get connected is to join a small group. That's a where you gather with a group every week to learn more about Jesus, pray for each other, spend time in community. If you want to join a group, a great way to do that is to either send us an email directly to the office or fill out the contact us form on our website. Now you can just enter, I want to join a group, and then someone will get in contact to talk to you about that. Uh, another thing that we just want you to be aware of is that um, uh, as we're getting into the holiday season and everything, just to stay updated with what we got doing, uh, paying attention to our, our social media or our um, services is a great way to be able to do that. So make sure to stay in the know for all the stuff that we got going uh, as we enter into the holiday season. Uh, we also want to invite you to um, an opportunity for you to be able to participate through your giving and your tithing. Um, if you're a guest today, you're under no obligation to give. That's just a way that people who call uh, Riverside their home could partner with the mission of the church. The Bible says this crazy thing that everything we got, God has given us and that we are stewards of that. That means I'm not the owner, I'm the manager. And I am to manage the master's resources well in the way he invites us to. And one of the way he invites us to manage his resource as well is by giving and by tithing, living lives of generosity. And the generosity you show here at the church goes to expanding and fueling the gospel. Part of it goes out to missionaries uh, locally, regionally, and globally who are spreading the gospel around. Part of that funds the ministry we do here in Cottage Grove and now with online church beyond. Uh, part of that also gets used for the facilities, you know. Um, we see our facilities, we're right next to the high school. Um, we've been a, a place where people from the community can use our facilities. Um, we see that as an extension and an opportunity to share Christ's love and his gospel. So everything that we do is meant to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we invite you to join us in that journey. Church, I'm so glad you've made the decision to join us today. I'm going to say a prayer for us, and then we're going to get into the music portion of our service today. Father God, we come before you, and we thank you. Thank you, God, for your goodness, your love, and your mercy. God, we come before you today and pray that whether we're having a good time or maybe a hard time right now, that we would feel your presence and your peace, God. Let us hear from you today. Let us experience you more and follow this wonderful journey you have in store for us. We love you. We thank you. It's in your holy and precious name that we pray today. Amen. Won't you join us as we worship today? Savior, I come, quiet my soul.
going to do it. I'm going to start this time together, you and me, with an extremely controversial question. So get ready for it, okay? In case you didn't know, today is the first Sunday in November. We are already in November. And I want to know, have you started listening to Christmas music yet? Let me know in the comments below. Yes, I have. No, I haven't. Yes, I kind of want to. No, I don't really like to. Have you started listening to Christmas music yet? Because the reality is some people are crazy about this stuff, man. November 1st, and it's like the tree is up. The lights are going. Uh, the pumpkin spice lattes are here. There's cinnamon everywhere. And the Christmas songs are playing. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're kind of more bah humbuggy, which is fine. However, it works for you. But I always am fascinated this time of year as to how adamant people are with starting their Christmas songs or not starting their Christmas songs. Because, you know, I think it really gets at this idea deep in our souls that we love to anticipate things. You know, there have been researchers who have actually done work in our brains to find out that we actually experience more excitement and joy anticipating something than when it actually happens. Now, of course, when things actually happen, it's all good and well, but the anticipation actually releases different kinds of things in our minds and in our bodies than the actual event. And for some of you, you're neck deep in the Christmas music anticipating it, anticipating the hope and the goodness and the wholeness that often comes with the Christmas season. And you know, I think that's an important thing for us to kind of hone into. Because this idea that there are better things or good things ahead is meant to be something that really influences and impacts our lives. Part of being followers and believers in Jesus means that we believe that there's going to be a day when all wrongs are righted, when things are made perfect, when things are made whole, and we're in the presence of our Savior again. That there one day will be better days ahead. And Part of anticipating that is meant to impact us here in our present life. Might not always feel like it, but that is the goal. That the anticipation for the goodness and the wholeness that Jesus is going to bring about is something that is meant to impact our lives today. That's really what this whole holiday and Christmas season is about, is in anticipation looking forward to the day when Jesus Christ will make all wrongs right and uh, all things will be made new. And you know that's all fine and dandy and good and everything, but it's likely you hear that, and one of the things you wonder is like, okay, that's like good and all, but what if there aren't really any better days ahead? Maybe that's what you're asking, like, that's great to like, want to look for something, to want to experience hope and have that impact you in the present, but what if there aren't better days ahead? What if the diagnosis I got this week, or the way my family is falling apart, or the struggles that I'm dealing with right now in this second is just the beginning of a series of more bad stuff? What if there aren't better days ahead in my financial life, in my family life, in my physical health life? What if there aren't better days ahead? And I think that's like a valid thing to talk about. Because the reality is, is that life is messy. 
And at no point is the gospel of Jesus Christ saying that life is not messy and that life isn't hard and that there aren't struggles. To, to just say that if we believe in Jesus hard enough and we'll have a suffer-free life is not the gospel at all. The gospel is that Jesus comes, he invites you into relationship with him, he saves you, he promises you hope and an eternity and a future, and he's with us in the bad days. When we're not even sure if there will be better days ahead, that he is with us in the bad days. And so there's this tension, like knowing that Jesus says there will be better days ahead, but also wrestling with the fact that sometimes it doesn't really feel like that happens, and that doesn't change the fact that right now doesn't feel very good for me, right? So the question then would be, how can you and I let the realities of the better days ahead Jesus has in store impact our lives today? Because if we believe in Scripture, where Jesus says that he'll right all of the wrongs, he'll come back one day, that there is goodness evermore for those who trust in Jesus, if we know that's the future, how do we let that impact our lives today? How do we let the anticipation for what is to come and the better things Jesus has ahead impact our lives today? That's what we're going to be talking about for a few minutes today as we seek to live lives completely and totally dependent and focused on Jesus Christ himself and how he wants to impact us with hope in the present as we look forward into the future. So if you have your Bibles today, we're going to be in the book of Joshua. It's an Old Testament book, chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. And here's what you need to know about Joshua going in, right? So Joshua is this book that's written about the Israelite, the ancient Jewish people. And as we look at the ancient Jewish people at this point in the First Testament, there's been a lot of crazy stuff that's gone on. And they've been slaves in Egypt. They got out of Egypt. God was following and taking them to what he, was the promised land. And on the way, they grumbled and they griped. And so they were forced to wander around in the wilderness for, for years and years as they waited for the time to enter the promised land. And as the book of Joshua happens, uh, the Israelite leader is a man who is appointed named Joshua, and he begins leading the Israelite people into the promised land. So the book of Joshua is full of battles and courage, and Joshua leading the Israelites into the land that God promised them. And all kinds of crazy stuff happens. And as we get to chapter 24, it's towards the end of Joshua's life. And Joshua, this leader of Israel, who led the Israelites into the promised land, begins reflecting on his life and sharing his wisdom and his heart with the people of Israel. And as we get into chapter 4, he's been telling the Israelite people things they need to focus on, things that they need to pursue, ways of living they need to adhere to in order to continue on forward to the better life that God has ahead. Because God carried them out of slavery in Egypt, he led them through the wilderness, and now he's leading them into the promised land. They don't totally have it all yet, but they've started entering the promised land. And Joshua here is trying to tell them that there are better things ahead, and that is meant to impact the way they live today. So let us, with open hearts and open minds, see what it has to say for you and my, me as we look with anticipation to the better things Jesus has in store and how that's meant to impact us in the present even when we experience suffering and struggle. I'm going to say a quick prayer for us and then we're going to get into the text today. Father God, we come before you today and God, we pray that you would speak to us through these words in Joshua. God, that the, the things that you call them to are things that you call us to as well. May we have the ears to hear you, the eyes to see you, and the hearts open to be receptive for what you have for us. We love you, God. We thank you. And it's in your holy and precious name that we pray today. Amen. So this section in Joshua begins like this. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now remember here, Joshua is beginning to communicate to his people, guys, I'm going to pass away soon. God has continuously better things ahead for you. And these are things you need to focus on in the present to really pursue and walk on the path that God 
has for you. And he says it like this. First, there's that word now. When we see the word now or therefore, we know that he's continuing a thought that he's been saying. This continuation of a thought of, guys, I want you to know this so you can continue moving forward in your life in Jesus. So that you continue moving forward in the relationship with Jesus in the things that he has for you. And now that I've talked to you a little bit about that, and I've kind of covered the history of how far God has carried us, this is what I want you to do. Because earlier in the chapter, Joshua was, was recounting all the times God came through for the people again and again and again as he invites the Israelite people to embrace these few things to stay on the path of faithfulness. He reminds them of the way that God has been faithful to them. And for the Israelite people up to this point, it's been in all kinds of crazy ways. God has carried his people through the sin of the Garden of Eden, through the family messiness in the book of Genesis, through Egyptian slavery in Exodus, through wilderness travel, through all these things. God has been faithful and he has not left them, even when it would have made sense for him to do that. Because Let's be honest, when you look at the First Testament and you look at the way the Israelite people were, they don't really seem like the best people to hang out with. God saves them from Egypt, and before long they're like, man, Egypt was so much better, let's just go back! Even though God rescued them from literal slavery. They complained to their leaders, they complained to Modus, they were grumblers and gripers and complainers. But God still stuck with them. That even when Israel was faithless, God was faithful. And you know, it's easy to point fingers at them, but their story is often our story. That often we are faithless when we come to God. Often we grumble and we gripe and we run and we you know, kind of block God as best as we can. And even when we do that, God is faithful in his mercy and his love and his goodness in his grace and in his provision. It's a reminder as we even just look at where this is coming from that God's faithfulness to Israel is an indicator of how he is faithful to his people. And if you are considered one of his people, his faithfulness is far beyond anything that you could begin to comprehend because he loves you. And because of that, he has good things in store for you. Jesus says, I came to give my people abundant life, life to the full. And Jesus wants you to experience, of course, one day when you get to heaven, but even more importantly, now here in the present. Doesn't mean life's going to be perfect, doesn't mean there's not going to be struggles, but it does mean that the, the kingdom life is accessible now. And Jesus wants you to experience it. Jesus wants you to walk in the fullness you were created for. He wants you to be who you were created to be. Finding your fulfillment in him, your hope in him, your goodness in him. That's what Jesus is inviting you to. And part of the way we remember that and we work on our own faithfulness to God is remembering his faithfulness when we were sometimes faithless. And so Joshua, that's kind of his springboard, his jumping off point. And he says, now do these few things. Fear the Lord, serve him with all faithfulness, and throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped. And then he kind of gets into some details about what those were. So from the beginning here, Joshua is giving us a, a bit of an idea of what we should do to kind of walk this path towards better things. Because like I mentioned before, we will have struggles in life, but Jesus wants to bring about healing in your life today. There might be addictions that we struggle with our whole life, but that doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't want to bring about healing. That Jesus still wants to be about bring about healing and goodness and wholeness, even if there is difficulty in the route we're going on right now. And it all gets at this idea of serving God with all faithfulness. We'll talk about the other dynamics, but they all kind of fall under this umbrella of serving God with all faithfulness. I love the word faithful. It's a word that reminds us that you're sticking to something, that you're committed to something, that you're going to come through on something. And you know, sometimes when I think about faithfulness, I think of all the times I've messed up. Times I said I was going to be somewhere and I wasn't. The times I didn't stay up to my word. The times where I just hurt other people. But the beautiful thing about Jesus is that he is the faithful one, the ultimate faithful one. The one who lived the life we couldn't, died the death we should have, and rose again. And when we look at the faithfulness of Jesus, we're reminded that through his power and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we are called and brought into a way of doing life where we are called to be faithful through his power. 
And you know, this invitation to move on to better things ahead, this invitation to kind of take one step at a time towards the things that God has for us is a call to be faithful. And the thing I love about faithfulness is what might be faithfulness for one person might not be faithfulness for you. Now, there are some generalities, like what we're going to talk about here in this text in a second, but there are some idiosyncrasies to faithfulness that God is calling uniquely you to. Like, for instance, if you have a, 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 maybe a husband or a spouse or kids, God is calling you to be faithful to your spouse and to your kids. He's calling me to be faithful to my spouse. He's calling that person to be faithful to their spouse. There's a little bit of individuality and uniqueness to it, right? Uh, your job, maybe you work at like a lumber mill, maybe you're an insurance agent. God is calling you to be faithful in the job that he's called you to. He's not necessarily asking me to be a faithful insurance agent because I'm not one. He's not necessarily calling me to be a faithful lumberjack because I'm not one. God is calling us to be faithful in unique areas and general areas as well. And there's some things that are unique to you that God's calling you to be faithful with. Maybe that's reaching out to people who are in your sphere of influence, loving the people he's called you to love, living in the community he's called you to live in, like the cul-de-sac or just your neighbors, you know? God wants us to serve him with all faithfulness. There's some generalities to that, and there's some specifics to that. And so often, we get so caught up with uh, worrying about what we don't have that we're not faithful in what we do have. It says in another spot in the Bible that we're called to be faithful in the little things things which lead to greater things. You might be upset and concerned right now because you want that big career change, you want that um, promotion, you want to achieve, achieve, achieve when God is calling you to be faithful in the little things. Don't shirk the responsibility and the things that you have now whining and worrying and waiting for what you want in the future. Now God might bring that to fruition, but maybe right now he's calling you to wait and be faithful in what you have been given. Because being faithful in what we've been given now sets us up to be faithful in the things that God has for us in the future. And we are called, in light of this following God into a better way, to serve him with all faithfulness. And there's a couple dimensions to that that the text here talks about. One of that one of those things is to fear the Lord. Now, you might read that and be like, yikes, that sounds creepy. I'm already kind of scared of God. I'm scared he's going to lightning bolt me. I'm worried about him. I'm concerned about him. No problem being worried about God, right? But this idea of fearing the Lord is really this idea of revering him above all else. That's kind of a more literal interpretation. You could say revere the Lord. It's so this idea of God being your top priority. I'm going to say that again. The idea of fearing the Lord is this idea of making God your top priority. That is the number one thing you and I are called to be faithful in. Making God our top priority, our top relationship. The biggest thing we invest our time and our life and our energy into is knowing God, being with him, not doing for God, but knowing him. We're called to do things for God and to be faithful, but it all starts with being faithful and prioritizing him as our ultimate. We be with God before we do for God. And that is one of the first steps of faithfulness that we're called to take. The biggest step, the most important step, is to revere the Lord above all else. Because if you revere him above all else, you'll be a better employee. You'll be a better husband or wife, a better dad, a better friend, a better mom, a better grandma. Those things naturally fall into place when we revere God, when we respect him above all else, when we seek him above all else, when we see him as our ultimate thing that we pursue above everything else. One of the main ways we're called to be faithful, to serve God with faithfulness, is to fear or revere the Lord. The other thing that this text invites us to do in order to be faithful, to continue on the path that God has for us for a more abundant life, is to throw away the gods our ancestors worshipped, beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and instead to serve the Lord. Now you might read that and you might be like, okay, I don't spend my Saturdays hanging out in front of a statue and, you know, kind of doing one of these programs. I ain't serving other gods. Like, I already got that down pat. But here's the deal. This idea of serving other gods doesn't mean that you just show up and bow to a statue. 
It means that our primary mode of faithfulness that we are called to is to prioritize and worship God above all else. And this idea of throwing away the gods our ancestors worshipped is understanding that our hearts always want to make an idol out of something. And this idea of an idol is this idea that there's something that we find our ultimate hope in. And if we don't find it in God, we're going to find it in something because that is how the human heart works. We're going to look for it in relationships. We're going to look for it in money. We're going to look for it in sex. We're going to look for it in all these different things if we don't prioritize God as our ultimate. And there's kind of an interesting nuance here where he says, throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped. That word ancestor is really interesting because here's the deal. We like to think we're super unique and individual and cool and all these different things. Here's the reality. We are more of a product of the environment we're brought into than we would care to believe. God says this really interesting thing in the book of Exodus where he says that um, to those who um, sin and commit these bad things, uh, that, that they're kind of cursed from generation to generation, from the third to the fourth generation. And lots of people have, you know, kind of made their guesses as to what that means. But here, here's the thing. We tend to take on the baggage of our families or the lack of families that we grew up in. And that's just part of life. That's unfortunately just part of living in a broken world. Either you, you kind of follow the standard in some of the unhealth of the family, or in such a, a violent rebellion against it, you take on other terrible behaviors that run countercultural to it. And in the last several years, we've actually found out through science in the brain and studies they've done in the brain and with DNA that um, the, the way we handle stress and the way we deal with things in our life actually alters our DNA and can pass on to our kids. Isn't that crazy? A little sobering, right? But the beautiful thing is God has designed us in such a way that even our bodies themselves were built to be redeemed. That brains that have built up patterns in your life, patterns of unhealth and addiction, even years into it, the brain can still be rewired. That's why it says in Romans 12, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because even after a lifetime of bad decisions, your mind can still be renewed. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful thing? And the reality is, is that so often we take on idols and addictions from our families that we grew up in. Maybe your family really prioritized family to the point where it was unhealthy. And now your family is an idol over other things in your life. Maybe in your family, the idol was numbing your pain with alcohol. And maybe that's the struggle you have today. You swore you would never be like the alcoholic parent you grew up with, yet that is the struggle for you. There are things in our life that pass down, that try to take a hold on our life so that we try to be more faithful to that idol than Jesus as our ultimate. And so one of the things I think that we need to understand is that Jesus is inviting us to throw those away off of the throne of our heart and instead to put God there because God was meant to be there. And the idol of money is great until it chokes you. It's great until you don't have it. The idol of relationships is great until you suffocate that person and they run away or they hurt you. The idol of numbing yourself out on shopping or alcohol or drugs or whatever it is is really attractive until it makes your life fall apart, until you lose the job, your family members, your health. That stuff might work for a while or might seem to work for a while, but rea in reality, if it's in the wrong place, it's killing you. And it doesn't have to be bad things. Sometimes it's good things gone wrong. Family's a great thing. We, we really value families here. But if your kids take more of a place in your heart than God does, you're going to crush your kids with the weight, the God-sized weight that you're putting on them. So we are called to be faithful. And the ultimate faithfulness is to look to God as our ultimate and to throw away the other things in our life that seek to be our ultimate. And this isn't a one-time, bam, I'm not struggling with that thing anymore. It's going to be a process, and it's going to be difficult, and it's not always going to be easy. But the, the path to a better life ahead 
involves the painful process of peeling back some of the things in our life that have been holding us down, the gods of our ancestors, and serving God and moving towards him with all faithfulness. He goes on in the next verse to say, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Like, Joshua's not crazy. He's not um, unrealistic. He understands that not everybody is going to want to say yes to the faithfulness of God rather than the faithfulness of their idols. Because here's the reality. Ultimately, God is pursuing you. He is seeking you. He is calling after you. He is trying to reach you with his grace. But it is up to us whether or not we say yes to the gift he is offering. Have you ever turned down a gift? It's kind of awkward, right? Sometimes someone goes and they get something really nice for you, but you don't have room for it, or you don't like it, or you don't need it. So what do you do? You either take it home and you kind of throw it away, or you say, ah, thanks but I don't really want that gift, you know? That's how it is with Jesus. That Jesus offers us life and goodness and grace and redemption. It is a free gift on behalf of what he's done, but we have to say yes to the gift. And for some people, saying no and goodbye to the idols that have held them back and saying yes to Jesus is undesirable. That's just the reality. We want to reach as many people we can with the goodness and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, there will be those who say yes wholeheartedly and have their life transformed. But there will also be those who really don't see it as a very desirable thing. Because it's kind of fun doing the other stuff. Or it's more enjoyable doing the other stuff. Or I want to be in control of my life. And Joshua understands this, and as he's calling the Israelite people to take the step forward into the new life, the better life, the different life that God has in store for them, he understands that it's going to seem undesirable to people. And you know, he's putting the ball in their court. He's saying, choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. Joshua understands that he ultimately is not the one who decides whether the other person follows Jesus. And there's some of us who have kind of slipped into these idolic, idolatry tendencies where we are so invested in what another person does that we take responsibility for them when they shouldn't. Now, we are called to share the gospel. We are called to share God's goodness with others. We are always to be demonstrating that and sharing that in our life. But we are never supposed to take the responsibility that is someone else's. Ultimately, it's your responsibility if you're going to say yes to Jesus or not. And so many of us, the idol of choice that we go with is taking on other people's problems so we can keep from dealing with our own. So that we're more willing to uh, be kind of um, uh, over-invested in someone else, to um, take on the thing that is theirs to bear, rather than dealing with the stuff in our own hearts. And ultimately, this decision to pursue faithfulness with God, we're not going to do it perfectly, but it involves taking the step. It involves taking that step towards greater faithfulness. Taking that step to saying, how can I grow in my faithfulness of God? Do I need to join a small group? Do I need to find a way to read my Bible more? Do I need to pray more? Do I need to spend more time in solitude? Do I need to take Sabbath days? What step do I need to take to grow my relationship with God? And what do I need to step away from? Because the reality is sometimes a step towards God is a step away from something else. Maybe that stuff you've been depending on to make your life count, to numb you out, to hide and run from life, maybe that needs to be stepped away from so you can step towards God. And you know, maybe that involves hard work. Maybe that involves... Um, you know, joining a recovery group, if that's kind of what your thing is, or joining a small group if you have some stuff that you're working through, or having trusted friends nearby you who you can work through stuff with. Because the Bible says that we're supposed to do things in community. There's this kind of um, understanding we need to have where we need to make the decision to take the step. But once we take that step, we don't have to go through it alone. Jesus is there with us. Our church community is with us. We have to be responsible for taking the steps of faithfulness we're called to, but we do that knowing that there is a community to do their part and encourage us. It's kind of this balance, and it's kind of hard to strike, but it's very important if we want to move on to the better things that God has for us ahead. And then he says, 
whether it was the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I think it's really important here that as we get this idea that we need to uh, step out of faithfulness towards bad things and towards the faithfulness of God, that um, the default is not to move towards God. Like, notice this here. He's calling the Israelite people to go into this new land that there are better things ahead, but it is a land of hostility. That it is a land where the Amorites live, where the people beyond the Euphrates live, and these people live in ways that are contrary to God. Here's the deal. Oftentimes, we spend a lot of time either ignoring how culture influences us or complaining about culture and assuming that it's just going to be an everybody loves Jesus thing. Here's the deal. The culture of the world is not prone towards God. That's just the way it is. And we need to come to that understanding that, that, that God invites us to follow him in faithfulness. And that's not going to be the default for most of the world. Everybody's got to make that decision, right? But we also need to understand that we are not called to hide in this fort away from culture. We are meant to go into culture to share the goodness and the love of Jesus Christ. That part of the path forward to God's abundant and good life is into a land where there is hostility. It is into a land where people don't do things like you do, where they're not going to be prone to saying yes to Jesus. Jesus. But you are still called to go into that land and experience Jesus' abundant life in the midst of it. There's some of you who have been hurting and complaining and struggling because you're, you want to follow Jesus, you want your life to be abundant, but those nasty sinners around me, here's the deal. That's part of the gig. And you were a nasty sinner before you said yes to Jesus. That we need to have this understanding and this realization that the land in which we are living, that we are foreigners, the Bible says, that we are aliens, the Bible says, that we are on a temporary assignment here as ambassadors of King Jesus. And we are to be faithful in that. That you and me, we are called to be faithful in this land that is not our own as we follow the abundant life Jesus has for us. There will be struggles, it won't always be easy, it will be difficult, but we can have that soul satisfaction of knowing that we have been faithful in what Jesus has called us to do in the land we are living, which is primarily and firstly above all else to prioritize him as the king and the Lord and the ultimate of our life and be faithful in the things that he's entrusted us with. Because ultimately, I can't decide what culture is going to do. I can't decide what this people group is going to do. I can't decide on whether the world's going to decide to take on Christian values. But I can decide what is what I'm going to do. And ultimately, he's inviting us to say, you know what? There's certain things we can't control, but I am offering a path forward for you where you take handle on what you control, trusting in the goodness of the Lord your God and making the decision that me and my household will serve the Lord. I can't make that decision for my neighbors. I can't make that decision for the culture, but I can make that decision for me. And making that decision is the step of faithfulness to the King of Kings, making him my ultimate so that I can follow the path he is paving for me towards his expansion of his kingdom. Life might be tough, but if we're faithfully following Jesus forward, we're following him into his kingdom where his kingdom is being expanded. And it might seem like failure by the world standards, but the question is, is it success in the standards of Jesus? If we're measuring based on the success of, am I committed to God in all things? Am I being faithful to what he's calling to? Is love the marker of my life? Am I following Jesus the way he wants me to? If those answers are yes, we are on the path towards the things that Jesus has in store for us. And my invitation to you today is that you would take the steps of faithfulness. That you would see what God does have in store for you by saying yes to his faithfulness. We look at these three verses. And one of the things we see is that the path forward, the path of progress, the path of moving in the direction Jesus wants to take us, it requires small steps of faithfulness towards a faithful Savior. That's what it's all about. It's not about being a pro, because the gospel isn't about well, everything I can do. It's about everything that Jesus did. 
It's about following our faithful Savior one step at a time, because honestly, that's all we can do. We can just do the best that we can every single day, surrendering to God, seeking God, taking things one step at a time. That's what it's all about. You want to move ahead to the things God has in store? If you want to find out how the, the hope and anticipation of the future impacts our life today, it is by being faithful in the small things and in the small steps day by day. Because as we do that, we declare to ourselves and the world around us, I'm moving in a direction where I know the destination is God bringing all things together again. We're on a path, we're on a journey, we're on a story that God is writing that ends in ultimate redemption. And in order to continue moving forward on that path, it involves small steps of faithfulness today. So in light of that, I want to ask us a couple of questions today to, to reflect on as we finish up. The first is this, what does daily faithfulness look like in your life? What does it look to be faithful every day? to spend your time prioritizing God, to be loving to your kids and your family, to be loving to your friends, to be, be fully committed and loving in the job that God has called you to. What does it look like? For some of you, that might mean that you need to change your attitude at work and sh be a little bit more about gratitude than you are about grumbling. For some of you, that means you need to stop hiding, you need to stop working late and hiding from your family and get home early so you can have dinner with them, so you can invest in them so you can read them a bedtime story at night. For some of us, that might mean reaching out to a friend we haven't reached out to in a long time. For many of us, that means intentionally investing the time in God each and every day. It's so easy. It's so easy to let slip by. But it means saying, I'm going to spend some time praying to God today. I'm going to spend some time in his presence. I'm going to spend some time in solitude with him. I'm going to prioritize my day around spending time with Jesus. What does daily faithfulness look in your life? And what's one small step you can take this week? If your mission forward is to have a better attitude at work, maybe the step for you is to say, you know what, on Monday I'm going to list three things that I'm grateful for at work and I'm going to speak them out loud. Maybe if you're being called to be faithful and being more present with your family, you're going to say, you know what, Monday I'm going to get off an hour early my phone's going to get turned off and I'm going to have dinner with my kids and my family. Maybe if it's reaching out to a friend, maybe it's doing the hard work of texting them and seeing what's going on. Maybe if it's prioritizing your relationship with God and it involves you writing out your week and saying, this is the time I'm going to spend with God. And I'd advise you do it early in the day because it makes all the difference. Maybe taking those steps, those small incremental steps, are what move you forward again and again and again on this journey of growing closer to Jesus and seeing what good things he has ahead of you. Maybe each step towards there is a step away from that crippling addiction. It's a step further away from the pain you had growing up, a step further away from the things that bog you down. What does it look like to take faithful steps every day? And the reality is, is you might look at that and feel overwhelmed, but here's the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That when we were faithless, when we were a mess, when we had no way of saving ourselves, that's when Jesus showed up. Jesus was the faithful one in place of us faithless ones. Because I don't know about you, I would not have been able to live a perfect life. I would not have had the courage to die on a cross for people who spurned me and spit on me and hated me. But Jesus Christ did. He loves you so much that he achieves perfect faithfulness on our behalf. That's how we are saved, based on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, not our faithfulness. And the gospel invitation, as we find our hope in the faithful one, Jesus Christ, is through the power of his Holy Spirit to declare his gospel and the future he has in store through our daily faithfulness. I believe that God has better things ahead, church. Doesn't mean life's always easy, but I believe that ultimately he wants his cross and his resurrection to drastically impact your life for the better. May we take the small steps of faithfulness every day to declare to ourselves in the world the faithfulness of our glorious Savior. Would you pray with me? 
Father God, we come before you today. God, thank you for your goodness and your love and your mercy. God, we thank you that you are faithful even when we're not. God, that you proved on the cross your faithfulness. And that brings us into the kingdom of life and the kingdom of light. And we pray that through the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, that we would be able to take the steps of faithfulness to continue on the path you have for us, God. That we would declare to ourselves and the world, you have better things in store ahead. God, help us to identify the ways we can be faithful in the things you've given us in our life. And help us take that next step this week to make it happen. We love you. We thank you. And it's in your holy and precious name that we pray today. Amen. You know, as we finish our time together today, we're going to spend just a minute taking communion together. Communion is this beautiful thing that we do where we, um, through the use of symbols, remember what it was that Jesus Christ did for us. That he died on a cross for you and me. That he was faithful up to that cross so that we could be made right in the sight of God and become sons and daughters of the Most High King. And you know, as we do that today, I invite you to just use whatever you can in your house. If you have a cracker, maybe some bread or something like that, to grab that and something to represent the body element. And then something to represent the cup, you know, whether that's maybe some water or whatever you have around. And as we take that today, we're going to start with the element of the body. And as we start that today, we remember that Jesus Christ's body was literally wounded for you and for me that it cost him something to bring us back into a relationship with God. It was a cost that cost him his very life. And as we approach that today, as we reflect on this idea of faithfulness and this idea of how we sometimes are faithless, but Jesus is always faithful, we remember the faithfulness that he was willing to go across to be faithful to the work he wanted to do to bring us back into a relationship with God. With grateful hearts, let us take the bread element together today. And in a similar way, we also take the cup. And the cup represents the blood of Jesus that was spilled on our behalf. The Bible says crazy things like, through Jesus Christ bleeding for us, we're actually healed. By his wounds, we are healed. That Jesus offers us his healing and his grace and the opportunity to be in a relationship with God through what he did. So as we take the cup today, let us remember that he was crucified for our sins, that he loved us so much, he was willing to shed his blood so that we could be healed. Let's take the cup together today. Would you pray with me? Father God, as we come before you today, we remember by taking the bread and the cup that you died for us, God that you were willing to, to suffer so that we could be saved through you. Jesus, it is with grateful hearts that we come to you and pray that your goodness and your love would follow us all the days of our life. We trust in you and what you accomplished on that cross, God. As we struggle today, maybe with the idols of our lives, the addictions of our lives, the struggles of our lives, God, we surrender it to you and declare that on that cross you took care of it, God. Help us to trust you each and every day. Forgive us of our sins and help us to trust in you and the faithfulness of your cross every single day. We love you and we thank you. And it's in your name that we pray today. Amen. Church, it's wonderful to spend some time with you today. Pray that you are richly blessed this week and that the reality of Jesus, what he did in his cross and his resurrection, would completely and radically change your life. And as we look to his faithfulness, that we would become more faithful in every area of our lives. We love you, church. We'll see you soon.